Okay, I think it makes sense to go ahead and get started. We seem to have a pretty solid number of our audience on. So first I wanna introduce myself. Um, hi everyone, my name is Michaela Morris and I am an Oceans Fellow with Environment America. We are a nationwide nonprofit that works to protect clean air, clean water, and open spaces. Thank you for joining us this evening for the first part of our Amazing Oceans webinar series. This, one, this evening's program will be on Stellwagen and Bank. With us tonight, we have Dr. Les Kaufman, Professor of Biology at Boston University, and Priscilla Brooks, Vice President and Director of Ocean Conservation at Conservation Law Foundation. Stellwagen Bank is a national marine sanctuary located just off the coast of Massachusetts, between Cape Ann and Cape Cod. The area is a kind of underwater wonderland filled with deep sea corals, whales, dolphins, and much, much more, as you'll hear about tonight. On today's program, we'll first hear from Dr. Les Kaufman about the marine life and unique geographic features you'll find in Stellwagen and how the sanctuary is managed. Next, Priscilla Brooks from Conservation Law Foundation will talk about the designation of the bank as a marine sanctuary and why we must do more to protect this special place. But before we dive into the panel portion of the evening, I want to share with you a bit about why I'm excited to work to protect marine sanctuaries like Stellwagen Bank. I grew up on the seacoast of New Hampshire and every summer I spent most of my time on the beach skin diving with my dad, I explored underwater forests of seaweed and watched crabs scuttle between rocks. At low tide, my friends and I built drip castles. And each summer, my cousins and I tracked the growth of piping plovers. Their development from fuzzy chicks to adults marked the nearing of September and our return to school. I want to be a part of protecting our oceans and beaches so others too can experience the same kind of meaningful connection with the natural landscape, with friends, and with family that I've found at the beach. Protecting important ocean habitats, like Stellwagen, is an important step in keeping our oceans and beaches and their ecosystems healthy. So now I'm going to turn it over to Dr. Les Kaufman, who will talk about his experiences researching Stellwagen Bank and why conservation is important. Thanks, Michaela. Uh, so I don't know how many of you are familiar with Stellwagen Bank intimately, but uh, if you look on the left, there's kind of a lozenge-shaped or rectangular area lying between P-Town and Gloucester. Uh, and that's the area that's been designated as the National Marine Sanctuary. And at the core of it is this shallow area of mostly sand and gravel called Stellwagen Bank that was discovered by the dude on the right, uh, Captain Henry S. Stellwagen, uh, while he was taking soundings at the mouth of the uh, Mass Bay in 1854, which is surprisingly recent. Uh, my su suspicion is that fishermen knew about it a long time before that. Um, Stellwagen Bank is known to the fishing community as Middle Bank, and if you look at the map, you can see why it's in the middle. And uh, that's the area in which uh, it was designated as a sanctuary because of the incredible habitat diversity and the abundance and richness of life there. It's a national marine sanctuary in very close proximity to a large urban population. So its value is extreme for all the different things that we get from it, in addition to the conservation of marine wildlife. Next slide, please. Thanks, Michaela. You can see how heavily used it is in this map that was created by uh, my UCSB colleagues, led by Ben Halpern, that shows the intensity of use for all purposes uh, in the inner, part of uh, Ma Mass Bay and Gulf, Southern Gulf of Maine. And there's the outline of the sanctuary. You see that pink line running across the screen. That's the major shipping channel into Boston. And that was relocated slightly 
to reduce the impact of shipping on right whales, which are not adept at getting out of the way of modern ships. There are three areas indicated for wind farms. Those were just for study purposes. There are no planned wind farms in this part of uh, the Gulf of Maine. But just look at how intense that use is, especially right on top of Stellwagen Bank. So this is a national marine sanctuary where it's supposed to protect things. And yet it's one of the heavy, most heavily used areas in this part of the ocean, including for the extraction of fish as part of our fisheries. Next slide, please. So as you might expect, a lot of these uses are in conflict with each other. Back when we were first creating the Massachusetts Ocean Plan, uh, in order to comply with the Mass Oceans Act, which was promulgated in 2008. Uh, lots of stakeholders got together and as a first step, tried to imagine which of the many uses are compatible or even mutually supportive, which were in direct conflict and which ones we just didn't know. And what's in red here is direct conflict. What is in green is compatible but look at the we just don't know. I mean, there's been very little work to really deeply understand how human activities interact with each other and with the ecosystem. And so that's what my research team is focused on. Next, please. Thanks. And uh, the core of all this is something called a trade-off. I mean, everybody knows what a trade-off is, but trade-offs among the good things we get from nature are particularly challenging. We rely on Stellwagen Bank uh, as a place where certain energy installations might be placed. Right now there's a natural gas terminal. Uh, we rely on it for its aesthetics, its beauty. And we rely on it because we fish there and we extract things to eat or to sell. But at the same time, it's the home of the most endangered whale, large whale in the world, the right whale, North Atlantic right whale in the lower left. It's part of a larger ecosystem that extends way up onto land through the watershed and includes a lot of highly endangered, well, not a lot, tiny pieces of highly endangered old growth forest. And one of the major denizens of the sanctuary is a cod so important in the founding of our nation that a sacred wooden cod hangs in the Massachusetts State House. It's also kind of a, it disappears occasionally when pranksters hide it. The real cod has disappeared <laughs> practically, and it wasn't because of pranksters, it was because we ate them. And now as the waters of the Gulf of Maine warm faster than any other bay on earth, cod are moving north many, many problems in terms of trade-offs and climate change to deal with. Next, please. Michaela? Yeah. Did it, going? It, yeah, it yeah. Have gone. Oh, there we are. Okay. So the philosophy that's used to deal with these complicated interwoven resources and ecosystem processes is called ecosystem-based management. I don't want to go into it in great detail, but basically, it's a way of incorporating all the stakeholders and considering all the moving pieces in the system. And when you make a decision, taking into account that it'll have ramifying effects, not just on the thing you're interested in, but on everybody else's interests as well. And what drives this is the ecology of the system. You can see on the left in this diagram, but also the amazing and complex ways that people interact with each other and try to influence each other's decision making. That's the hard part of the problem. We published a book years back led by Karen McLeod and Heather Leslie on this idea and now we're trying to instantiate it through our research. Next please, Heather. I mean, uh, Michaela. <laughs> so many of these webinars. <laughs> okay, so uh, I'm, a, I'm an empirical biologist, actually, but I, that means I go out and look at stuff and I dive and I sail around and fly around and stuff like that. But I've been drawn into analysis and modeling to help try to solve these problems. And our approach to solving a trade-off problem 
is to create sort of a math of alternative possibilities. So we look at the system using all kinds of data. We have lots of data in the, uh, in the Gulf of Maine, North Atlantic uh, data portal. We see where activities are in conflict and we analyze that conflict using everything we know about the process of catching fish or the process of conserving whales and so forth. And based on that, we project possible outcomes of any change in policy. We assess the likelihoods of these alternative outcomes, and then we present that to the decision makers and they select the policy and implement it. It might be a change in the fishery, might be a change in shipping, could be anything. But then we have to go back out, the scientists, and see what happened as a result of that change in policy. So we go round and round from looking at the system to modeling it and imagining how it behaves to actually performing these experiments, which we call policies. And this is adaptive management, kind of learning by doing. Next, please. Okay, so I want to talk a little bit about how all this relates to one aspect of the sanctuary that is particularly amazing. And that's how it feeds such a wealth of wildlife just off Boston. Uh, I'm going to talk about these things called forage species, which are basically all the smaller animals that the big ones eat. And the, the predators in this case are things like cod, whales, bluefin tuna, and so forth. And uh, these animals eat zooplankton. They eat tiny copepods for the most part and serve as the bridge between primary production, the algal cells in the water that we call phytoplankton, and the bigger organisms that are worth money and support livelihoods. Some of these forage fish we eat too, like the squid or the herrings, and that can create a problem. So these are the animals that fuel other fisheries, that are used as food and aquaculture and feedstock for pharmaceuticals and vitamins, they're used for lobster bait. They determine where the whale watch industry is going to go because that's where the whales are going to be. They are critical to supporting all the biodiversity in the sanctuary and their food for wildlife and endangered species. So they matter. And one that matters a lot on Stellwagen Bank is the one in the upper right, that long skinny thing. It's called a sand lance. Next, please. So, what we decided, uh, we meaning the National Marine Sanctuary, its researchers and partners of the sanctuary and neighboring universities, US Geological Survey, Fish and Wildlife Association, things like that. Anyway, we decided we would try to understand the broad brush picture of how Stellwagen Bank works by looking at the forage species through the eyes of six predators. The upper left is a great shearwater, a seabird that's like a mini albatross, the humpback whale in the center, smiling with a mouthful of sand lance, the bluefin tuna in the upper right, in the center, a human being holding his prized catch, a big Atlantic cod. You don't see him much like that anymore. And then below the fisherman and the cod, a gray seal, a species of seal that has resurged in abundance and is now a major part of the ecosystem. We looked at the fat content, the food value of these different forage species. And what we found out is that sand lance is actually really, really nutritious. It's got a lot of fat and it's low on the food chain. Next, please. Okay, so sand lance in the upper left in their typical school, another happy humpback whale with sand lance just spewing out of his mouth. Uh, and a picture of how he got those sand lance. Humpback whales work in groups to create what are called bubble nets. You can see one in the lower left. They swim in circles and blow bubbles through their blowhole and the fish are afraid of the bubbles. And as you can see, this is helical. The net is closing on the fish. And once it's closed, uh, while one fish, can to one fish, one whale continues to corral the bait ball, another one goes deep down, opens its mouth, and surges up 
right through the school of fish, swallowing a huge ball of fish. And they take turns doing that. And the picture in the lower right is from what's called the D-tag. It shows the motions of a humpback whale during its hunt. The upper ones are a diurnal hunt. The lower ones are nocturnal. And what they showed us is that the whale at night goes to the bottom and scrapes his mouth along the sand, squeezing the sand lance out of the sand like toothpaste and sucking them up. So they have different feeding modes in the day and the night. Next, please. Okay, all of this is going on in just a few spots in a very concentrated way. So if you look at this part of the Gulf of Maine, there are these shallow sandbanks. Stellwagen is the closest. And at certain places on each of these banks, there's upwelling of nutrient-rich water fueling the whole food chain. And that's where everything gathers. The sand lance, the cod, the tuna, the whales, us. Go ahead. Okay, so our research team works like this. We go out, we know where the gaps are in our knowledge. We gather the information, study the animals hands on. Maybe we catch them and weigh them or measure them or study them in some other way. Often we put tags on them and send them off on their way to see where they go. We take all those data, put it into the computer model and forecast different ways the world could look under different policy scenarios. And then we communicate this to everybody, to the stakeholders, to the decision makers. And we use a model called MIMES, which is a way of analyzing the data on the computer. And we use a visualization tool or a user interface called MIDAS. And the research team currently doing this work is sanctuary scientists and scientists from Woods Hole Oceanographic, University of Connecticut, and uh, UMass Dartmouth. Keep going. Okay, so sand is really important. This is just a table, the numbers are really tiny, but it shows you that eight of the 19 top fishery species are totally dependent on sand and everything they can eat and do in the sand. And the rest of them use the sand a lot. So there are rocks and reefy areas on Stellwagen where the diversity is very high, but a lot of the productivity is over the sand. Next. If you look at where the whales are, there's a heat map on the right. Again, the shipping channel going through. These are baleen whales, whales that filter feed small fish and plankton, like the humpback whale. And you can see that they are heavily concentrated in the southern and southeastern and the northwestern part of the sanctuary. So those are examples of hot spots within the National Marine Sanctuary. And that teeny little red thing way at the top, that's the southern flank of Jeffrey's Ledge, the next bank over. Okay, thanks. Yeah, all right, so Tammy Silva, a researcher at the sanctuary, took all of our data uh, including data on sand lands from the array in the lower left. You can see those little dots. It looks like a woodpecker's, so yellow-bellied sapsuckers attack the bank. And what those dots are are where we regularly sample for sand lands. And Anne-Marie Runfola has led a bird survey program called S4, which stands for something about science, citizens, or something like that, but we get volunteer birders to come on the boat, zigzag across the sanctuary every month and record all the birds. And what we can see from these data is that the birds and the sand lance, the whales here, sorry, and the sand lance are co-located right there in that hot Southern area. So this is humpback whales and sand lance. Next. Um, and we also tagged birds the Great Shearwater, it's very comical for me. If you'd love to hear how we catch them and do all this. Uh, there isn't time. I can tell you that it involves rancid fish livers that we throw it into the water to attract the birds. And uh, we've tracked many of these birds over the last seven years. You can see them in the lower left feeding all over the Gulf of Maine but they spend a lot of time in Great South Channel and in the sanctuary. 
And here on the right, you can see the contours for just our local study area. When they're done growing up in the sanctuary, the young birds fly almost 12,000 miles to Tristan de Cunha in the South Atlantic to breed. Next. Okay. So if we look at the S4 data and the Sandlands sampling, again, strong co-location. So the sanctuary is providing a mess hall for whales and seabirds, and it's based on Sandlands. Next. Okay, so we put everything we knew about Sandlands together into a table to figure out when the sanctuary is most vulnerable, when it would, it would be most dangerous for us to mess with the system and particularly the Sandlands. And you know why this is important. Our beaches are washing away. We need sand to put on the beach to protect real estate values. Ultimately, this is futile. The sea level is going up. But for the next little while, say the next 25, 30 years, we'll keep trying to keep the beaches where they are. But you don't want to dig up Sandlands habitat to do it, because then you're dinging the whale watch industry, the fishing industry, and the preservation of biodiversity. Next. OK, there's one more link I want to talk about, and then I'm going to pass it over to Priscilla. There are other forage species. These are pictures of river herring that we got with our photographer, Keith Ellenbogen. You can see them swarming up rivers all over eastern Massachusetts right now. Two species, um, blueback herring and alewife. Uh, you might see them right along the Charles, right along the banks right now if you went to look. They get up the rivers by going up these fish ladders that you can see in the lower right. And then they spawn in the upper waters, upper headwaters of each of our big rivers. And then the babies come down and uh, late in the fall and begin feeding at sea. In the lower left are two other anadromous or migratory fish that spawn up in rivers and live at sea. The sturgeons, short nose and Atlantic on the left, and the Atlantic salmon once upon a time lived in our area. Now the water is too warm. Next. Okay, so you'd never think this. But these herring go way upstream, especially our wife, and they want to lay their eggs in relatively still water if possible. And guess who creates all kinds of still water? Beavers. Beavers are on the move. They are building dams. Some of these dams can be penetrated by the adult herring. They lay their eggs in the beaver pond, and then the little fish go back down through the dam and out to sea when they've grown a bit. So this is incredible. There's actually a connection between beavers and whales via the insects hatched in the beaver ponds that are eaten by the herring that go back down the river and feed the whales. Next. It's not just herring that are benefiting from these ponds. So are birds. For the last 30 years, Elisa Landry has been studying tree swallows at Broadmoor Wildlife Sanctuary, halfway up the Charles. They also benefit from insects whose larvae live in the water and whose adults emerge into the air. Then the tree swallows feed on them and feed their young. So everything is connected. Next, please. Go through all the, yeah, just hit all the, okay. This is a slide made by one of my students, Laura Hackham. She was studying the role of goals in the system, but here she was just trying to point out that you can't look at one piece of the system alone and manage our interactions with it thinking you're done. And in our fishery, that's what we've been doing for the last hundred years is looking at one species at a time as if it had nothing to do with all the others. This must end. Ecosystem-based management is essential. Just looking at this picture, sandlands and right whales, that's a North Atlantic right whale, compete for the copepods that lay on their fat and allow them to migrate and reproduce. Meanwhile, humpback whales and seabirds are dependent on the sandlands and the blackback and herring gulls 
which are very aggressive and very lazy, try to steal as much food they can from everybody else or take scraps from fishing boats, yet they're still an important part of the system. And they feed back to seabirds by often eating the nestlings of the seabirds that do breed in our area. Great shearwater doesn't. He goes all the way to the South Atlantic, as we mentioned. So the major points I've made here are that Stellwagen Bank is a complex, chaotic system. We go in to pursue individual purposes, innocent, without realizing that any time you touch a tiny part of the system, the whole thing shakes and other people are affected. And our goal is to minimize negative impacts, maximize synergies, and it's not easy, especially when the one area that's supposedly protected is actually the one that's most heavily used. Thank you. Thank you, Les. So, Les, so now we'll hear from Priscilla Brooks, um, Vice President and Director of Ocean Conservation at Conservation Law Foundation. And just bear with me while I switch the slideshow, everyone. Mm Michaela, we're holding questions till the end, right? Yes, we are okay. holding questions to the end. Great. Oh, well, thank you, Michaela. And uh, thank you, Les. I, um, you know, whenever I see a beaver dam, I'm never going to be the same. I'm always <laughs> about Stellwagen Bank National Reef Sanctuary now. So thank you for that. Um, well, um, thanks, everyone, for being here. Uh, I'm excited to talk about Stellwagen. Um, first slide, please, Michaela. Is the slide, oh, it's showing though, right? Yeah, sorry, second. Okay, good. <laughs> Thank you. Um, so I'm gonna talk a little bit more about, um, about National Marine Sanctuaries, um, how they're designated, under what law, and um, some of the management challenges um, at Stellwagen Bank National Marine Sanctuary. And I note that the superintendent for Stellwagen is on the webinar. Hi, Pete. Uh oh. <laughs> <laughs> and um, we're you know, being watched. <laughs> he can. <laughs> I'm sure he'll correct me um, uh, if I um, if I stumble here. But um, I'm going to talk a little bit about the challenges facing Stellwagen and the opportunities um, before it because they're in the process of developing a new management plan. So uh, Stellwagen was designated in 1992 as a National Marine Sanctuary, but it was first nominated um, a decade early, earlier by the Center for Coastal Studies in Provincetown, Massachusetts and the Defenders of Wildlife. And, um, at the time, there was the threat of oil and gas development and also sand mining uh, within the sanctuary. And of course, after hearing Les talk about the importance of sand habitats, um, that was indeed a major threat. And so, um, so in 1992, um, Congress actually uh, designated Stellwagen. Uh, next slide, please. And, um, oh, and I wanted to mention that um, in 1996, um, during the reauthorization of the National Marine Sanctuaries Act, the members of Congress um, decided to honor their uh, colleague from Massachusetts who was retiring after 24 years of service um, in the House of Representatives, and that was Gary Studs. And so um, the sanctuary is, is named after Gary Studs. So uh, Stellwagen, uh, as you've heard from Les, is, is really, it's, it's an amazing place. And um, 
it's exactly right that it would have been designated as a national marine sanctuary because it's a national treasure. And um, it's located about 27 miles off Boston um, and it spans 842 square miles. Um, the sanctuary comprises uh, a dynamic system of all kinds of different habitats, shallow banks, boulder reefs, sand plains, as Les talked about. Um, and it's really, it's an extraordinary place because of its um, productivity and biodiversity. Uh, the sanctuary supports over 575 species of fish, seabirds, marine mammals, uh, and invertebrates. Uh, next slide. So um, we have a law um, called the National Marine Sanctuaries Act. It was passed in 1972, and it authorizes the Secretary of Commerce to designate and protect areas of the marine environment with special national significance due to their conservation, recreation, ecological, historical, scientific, cultural, anthropological, educational, or aesthetic qualities as national marine sanctuaries. And um, uh, sanctuaries support a lot of public education, research, and monitoring. Um, and depending on how it's designated, um, the sanctuary can regulate um, certain activities, uh, human activities. Uh, Next, please. So there are um, currently 14 national marine sanctuaries, and you can see them, see all the dots um, around the country. Uh, Stellwagen is New England's only national marine sanctuary. And the sanctuaries vary from sanctuaries that protect, you know, important uh, uh, biodiversity hotspots to sanctuaries that protect shipwrecks, like the Monitor National Marine Sanctuary off Cape Hatteras that protects um, a Civil War ironclad battleship. Uh, next page, please. I mean, next slide. So what's um, a little bit tricky about the National Marine Sanctuaries Act is that in, its, in the act itself, there's, you know, a bit, it, it, it requires a bit of a balancing act between protection and use, depending on the sanctuary and how it was designated. But this comes from sort of some, some dual purposes. Um, and, you know, the first being that um, the purpose is to maintain the natural biological communities in the National Marine Sanctuaries and to protect and, where appropriate, restore and enhance natural habitats, populations, and ecological processes. So that's the natural resource ecosystem piece. But also, the sanctuary is meant to facilitate to the extent compatible with the primary objective of resource protection, all, all public and private uses of the resources of these marine waters, not pr prohibited. So, um, so that's pretty, uh, it's pretty wide open, though, though I will underscore that the primary objective of a national marine sanctuary is resource protection. Okay, next slide. So as Les mentioned, um, Stellwagen is close to Boston and it is a very uh, busy sanctuary. Uh, this is a map of the shipping lanes um, that are overlaid on top of sightings of baleen whales and right whales, the little dots um, are, are right whales. And um, Stellwagen actually was um, very successful and there was a big problem with ship strikes of uh, marine mammals. And by shifting the shipping lanes, um, Stellwagen was able to uh, reduce that number significantly. But there's a lot of human activities out there from whale watching to shipping to fishing, uh, commercial and recreational fishing, um, you know, power boating. Um, next, please. So, um, so Stellwagen is, is just commencing um, a revision to its management plan. And they do this every 10 years. So the last one was um, in 2010. 
And um, the, uh, the first step in that is that they, they put together a really impressive uh, report called the Condition Report, um, which they just released um, in February 2020. Next. And what I was going to do is um, just, uh, you know, select a few of the results um, from that uh, from that uh, from that report that, um, you know, documents the um, not all is well in the sanctuary. So, um, so first off, um, so the so the condition report it rates a number of resource conditions on a scale of you know, good is the best, um, and that goes from good to fair to poor to undetermined. And so, um, so the overall status of living resources was rated as fair to poor, um, and you know, partially due to just the intensive human activity in the sanctuary and. Um, human activities like commercial and recreational fishing, shipping, and whale watching were documented as being a particular concern as they can cause negative impacts on living resources. And uh, it's fair to say that, um, you know, fishing occurs throughout the sanctuary, 100% of the sanctuary. And, um, you know, including um, bottom trawling, in most of a sanctuary, not all of it, and even some scallop dredging in there. Next. Um, so, so Atlantic cod, um, less mentioned that that is a really important fish in the sanctuary. Um, that was an impressive fish that person was holding, it was gigantic. Um, and, you know, Atlantic cod um, was once the mainstay of the New England ground fish fleet. And it has been overfished um, for at least three decades. Today, uh, New England's two cod populations, one on Georgia's Bank and one in the Gulf of Maine, is, 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 has been estimated to be about, or less than 10% of what scientists say is a healthy biomass level. Um, and the report, the condition report, the sanctuary put together, you know, details the, the decline of cod in the sanctuary and the decline in its status since the last condition report in 2007. Um, the report found that the remaining population of Gulf of Maine cod in New England is centered in or contracted into the sanctuary. So the sanctuary is, um, you know, perhaps has the last large, big aggregation of cod. And yet, um, and cod feed uh, on sand lands, among other things, in the sanctuary. So that's another reason why that forage fish that Les mentioned, sand lance, is so important. Um, but, you know, it's possible that Stellwagen is the last area with consistent aggregations of cod um, in the Gulf of Maine stock. And Despite the fact that uh, this, the, the cod was, its condition was rated as poor and worsening in the sanctuary, um, cod is the most sought after fish in the sanctuary. Okay, next. Um, and the sanctuary is also, as, as Les showed you, a hotspot for marine mammals. Um, boy, if you've ever had a chance to go out there on a whale watch, it's, it is truly phenomenal. It's an amazing sight. Um, and um, when I, I, you know, one of the first times I went out in a boat in New England, I went out to a still wagon and it was, it was just amazing. But, um, uh, you know, North Atlantic right whales are uh, frequent visitors to uh, Stell Wagon Bank National Marine Sanctuary. And as Les mentioned, they are the most endangered large whale species on the planet. There's thought to be approximately 400 of them um, on the planet today. 
And they are at continued risk of entanglement in fishing gear, ship strikes, and injuries from increased noise levels. And this has been documented in the sanctuary report. Um, it's also worth mentioning that Stellwagen Bank is a designated critical habitat for North Atlantic right whales. Um, and uh, the sanctuary is doing some really um, amazing research on, um, on noise, underwater noise in the sanctuary. And they have documented that underwater noise levels have you know, increased dramatically. And when it's loud and noisy underwater, right whales and other marine mammals um, can't communicate very well. And it also disrupts other behaviors like their feeding behavior. Um, next slide, please. Um, Les talked about forage fish, so, so I, want to, I won't do that, but um, you know, they're a imp really incredibly important group of species. Um, Atlantic herring um, is uh, targeted in the sanctuary um, for fishing and is currently at risk of, of being overfished right now. Okay, next. And finally, one other um, finding was that um, the report found, quote unquote, measurable degradation of benthic habitat quality because of of the impacts of bottom contacting fishing gear, among other things. And this is a photograph of an otter trawl um, being towed on the seafloor, and you can see the heavy doors uh, dragging across the seafloor. Okay, next slide. Now, it's important to keep in mind, you know, we're talking about Stellwagen, but this past year, um, there were two major reports uh, issued. The first, or over the past year, um, the first was um, a report issued by the International Panel on Climate Change. Um, and this was a special report they did on, on the ocean and cryosphere. Uh, cryosphere being the frozen parts of our Earth, the, the, the Arctic and Antarctic areas. Um, and what the report found was that, first off, that oceans have absorbed 90% of excess heat on the planet and one third of the carbon dioxide from greenhouse gas emissions. Secondly, um, you know, they documented uh, ocean acidification and, and impacts of climate change in all kinds of different species, finding that the ocean is becoming more acidic, is starved of oxygen, so it's not holding as much oxygen, and it's less habitable for fish and marine wildlife. And here, right here in New England, um, the Gulf of Maine is warming faster than 99% of the world's ocean waters. So it's, it's literally a hot spot on the planet. Um, next slide. The other important um, report that was issued was the Intergovernmental Science Policy Platform on Biodiversity and Ecosystem Services. And this report documented um, really just an astounding loss in biodiversity. Um, an estimated one million species are threatened with extinction, including a third of all marine mammals. Um, two thirds of the world's marine habitats have been quote unquote significantly altered by human activity. And fishing has the largest negative impact on marine biodiversity, you know, worldwide. So as we're thinking about Stellwagen and uh, developing a new management plan, I think it's, it's important to consider the context that Stellwagen is in, in the world, where you know, our ocean environment is, is threatened everywhere. Okay, next slide. And I guess I just wanted to um, underscore that the, the biodiversity report, um, talked about the importance of protected areas in protecting and, and restoring biodiversity. And research has shown that, you know, that protected areas or stable and intact ecosystems that protected areas can create are the most resilient to climate change. And fully protected marine reserves are proven to be one of the most effective ways to increase and protect biodiversity. Um, 
MPAs can also provide natural laboratories for research. Um, and, you know, these two studies have sort of catalyzed a, a, a national and international campaign called 30 by 30, where the idea is that to protect biodiversity and save the planet, really, we should be protecting 30% of land and 30% of the ocean. And you will undoubtedly be hearing more about that in, in the months and next few years. Next slide. So, um, so Stellwagen's um, plan review is underway. Um, and it really is an opportunity to address um, uh, new challenges and update responses to some of these ongoing issues. Um, the process involves research, reporting, and a lot of public engagement. Um, and there's an opportunity to, to really strengthen Stellwagen's uh, management of the sanctuary. Next slide. Just among, um, and now I'm, well, I have my conservation law fat hat on, but among the things that Conservation Law Foundation is is asking the sanctuary uh, um, for the new management plan is to enhance protections for North Atlantic right whales and other marine mammals. We'd like to see vessel speed restrictions, um, as well as um, you know regulations um, that can reduce the risk of fishing gear entanglement, and in particular, um, a reduction or really almost elimination of uh, vertical lines in the water, which um, are the cause of entanglement of right whales and other, other uh, marine mammals. And um, secondly, we'd like to see Stellwagen establish a fully protected, uh, dedicated habitat research area within the sanctuary. There is a research area there, but um, I don't know that there's a lot of um, uh, research research underway in the area and it is not fully protected. Um, also, uh, we'd like to see the sanctuary work with NOAA Fisheries and the Fishery Management Council to protect Atlantic cod in the sanctuary, protect that last vestige of a big aggregation of cod, um, and also the important forage fish that, that fuel the biodiversity in the sanctuary. As well, we, we um, support increased climate change monitoring and research in the sanctuary. Next slide. So this is just a, a quick slide that, that Stellwagen put together, uh, shows you the steps um, for the sanctuary management plan review. Um, again, it started in February with the uh, issuance of the condition report and um, it went through some public scoping um, they will develop the draft plan and release it um, for public review and comment. Um, and on and it will, you know, go to a final rule and finally be finalized in, I think they're aiming for 2022 or 2023. So it's a three-year process. Next slide. Um, so Michaela asked me to think about, you know, what what you could do for Stellwagen Bank National Marine Sanctuary. So the first thing um, I think uh, would be good is if you found a chart online and figured out where you lived relative to the sanctuary. Most people have no idea that we have a National Marine Sanctuary off our coast or even where it is. So, um, you know, this chart, if you live near Boston, well, you know, Boston is uh, right there in that you know, big cove, and you can see it's not very far off of Boston. Uh, secondly, uh, there's a lot of ways, well, there's, uh, you can go out to Stellwagen on a uh, recreational fishing trip or a, uh, a whale watching trip that is well worth it. And you can, you know, it's one of the sanctuaries that's actually close enough that you can really experience Stellwagen. Um, so that's pretty cool. Um, get on this sanctuary mailing list and learn about this national treasure. They've got incredible um, educational opportunities and even volunteer opportunities. Um, then finally, um, 
comment on the management plan and ask them for stronger management. And you can do this um, by, um, you know, all uh, the advocacy groups that are involved will let you know when, uh, when there's an opportunity to engage on the management plan, um, CLF or Environment America. Um, and finally, I would just say, you know, support protection of your ocean every chance you get. You know, if you get a chance to meet any of your, your meet the governor or legislators or members of Congress or even, you know, your, um, even your selectmen, do everything you can to protect our ocean because we need to. And I think that's it, Michaela. Great. That slide, I think is my thank you slide. That's a great photo. Um, thank you, Priscilla, and thank you, Les, for sharing that information with us tonight. I know that I definitely want to go on a whale watch uh, to sell lag, and I haven't been before, and it sounds incredible. It so is. now, <laughs> I got to get down there. Um, so now we are going to enter into the Q&A portion of the evening. So the way that will work is you can use the chat box to send in questions to our panelists, and then I'll read them in chronological order and direct them to the right person. And I can see that we actually already have a couple, so I'll start with those. I know we are almost at the end of our hour, so any questions that we don't get to, I'll do my best to respond to uh, via email tomorrow. Okay. Um, so Catherine would like to know a little bit more about um, the food web of the bank. Which less. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I was muted. I mean, a lot of people would like to be able to just do that to me whenever they want. <laughs> um, so uh, the food web of the bank is largely based on phytoplankton. I mean, in places closer to shore, there may be seaweed on the sea bottom, and that would produce food. But the bank's waters are deep enough that most of the primary production, as we call it, is from the sun hitting the water, nutrients coming up from below, and tiny algal cells, phytoplankton, blooming. And then those are fed upon by tiny arthropods, relatives of shrimp and lobster, uh, called copepods, and a host of other teeny creatures, including the babies of half the things that live out there. And uh, those zooplankton go into the small fishes like sand lance, which are then eaten by the bigger animals. And then there are great white sharks and uh, other predators that can take down the big guys. That's, that's the food chain, but the food web, like how many species eat, how many other species, you draw all those lines, the page turns black. Well, so interesting. Um, so our next question is from Baker, and Baker would like to know why we cannot designate the entire Gulf of Maine as a sanctuary. Isn't it true that Cassius Leg or Stellwagen would not be able to function as they do without all the currents and mm. microbes that circulate through designated areas? So maybe Priscilla could speak a little bit to this, and then um, if Les has things to add, that would be great. Uh, well, um, I think I think there's one question is, you know, I guess I would interpret this more as why can't we protect our ocean ecosystem better? Um, I, you know, the, it's a tall order to designate a national marine sanctuary. Um, there's a long, a long, long process. And um, so practically speaking, that would be very difficult to do. But, but um, but we, sh we really should protect more of our ocean. And the sanctuary, you know, it, you get a little bit um, depressed reading the condition report because you keep hearing this word, sanctuary, sanctuary, sanctuary. But I, if we haven't made it obvious, you know, the National Marine Sanctuaries Act doesn't necessarily mean that a place is protected. And we're seeing that in spades. Um, in Stellwagen, and it's it it has to do with the law and um, the fact that when sanctuaries are designated, it's in those designation documents where the types of activities that can be regulated are listed. 
and fishing is not one of those activities for Stell Wyman. Um, Les, maybe you, there's a lot about the interconnectedness of the ecosystem. Les, do you want to take that on this question? I guess, can you see, can you, uh, uh, can you see the question? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Michaela? Yes. You got to unmute me. Okay. You, you are unmuted. <laughs> okay. Uh, yeah, I think Priscilla hit it on the head. Uh, we need a, a system of spatial management that encompasses the entire world ocean, not just Stellwagen Bank, and that succeeds in achieving the goal Priscilla stated of putting enough of the ocean beyond our reach so that that can be the healing balm for the rest of the ocean that we're exploiting. Within the Gulf of Maine, there are zero significant marine reserves. In other words, areas that are entirely protected. We tried with the uh, collaboration of the commercial fishery to set one up on Stellwagen Bank, but there were other, other people doing other things who objected to that. And uh, until people can agree on the importance of saving for the future, of leaving nature enough space to heal herself. Until we get there, nothing will be safe. And that's true in the sea as it is on land. Very true. Um, this next question is from Drew and it is how many right whales have been lost due to entanglements in the area? And I know Priscilla, you do a lot on right whales. So maybe you want to answer this one first. Yeah, I actually don't, I can't tell you how many right whales have been entangled in the sanctuary. Um, and that's generally difficult um, to say, period, because what happens with right whales is they, they, they swim into fishing gear and become entangled in it. Um, but that, they don't just stop there and, and put up a sign and say, this is where I was entangled. <laughs> Instead, right whales keep going and they, you know, often drag uh, the fishing gear for weeks, months, even years. Maybe eventually they shed it. Maybe someone, you know, um, comes and um, uh, disentangles them. But the challenge um, with entanglement is that um, we don't often know where they got entangled and often we don't know you know, what kind of fishing gear it is or where that gear came from because much of the fishing gear um, is not marked. And, and hopefully that will change. We will have mandatory marking of fishing gear so we can at least understand, uh, you know, where gear entanglement is happening. But I don't know if there are any statistics on uh, whales, uh, how many whales have become entangled in Stellwagen. Les, do you know? Um, I don't know. I don't know the exact number this year, but in the in the last two years, the the major loss of right whales had to do with the fact that the waters are warm and the copepods they eat were mostly up north, and we had moved the shipping lane in in, uh, in Massachusetts, but it hadn't happened yet in Canada. And so there were many more ship strikes, but because the whales were now in an area that fishermen hadn't adapted to fishing in, in their midst, there were many entanglements as well. Uh, before though, 85% of the mortality and morbidity was attributable to ship strikes. About 15% were entanglements. I'm not sure, but I'm guessing that since we've dealt a lot with the ship strikes, entanglement has risen now in importance and we need to do something about it. And it's really vexing because we also put enormous value on our lobster fishery, which is one of the major sources of gear in the water that whales can entangle themselves in. Yeah, definitely it's a complicated issue. Um, but one of the best ways that we can protect our right whales and their ocean habitats and the ecosystems is building support for marine protected areas, I think. Um, so that is, we are at the end of our hour together this evening. Um, 
but I uh, want to thank everyone for joining us, first of all, and I will be getting to most of the questions that we weren't able to get to tonight. Um, and I'm also going to chat out a couple suggested social media posts because building, a lot of people don't know what marine protected areas are and might not know what Stellwagen Bank is. And it's hard to build support for, for these types of things if the public doesn't know. Um, so if each of you could share one of these posts or create your own on Facebook or Twitter, you'll play a pretty critical role in educating the public about this really amazing underwater, um, underwater habitat and you'll play a role in building support for more areas like this. You can also make sure to follow Environment America and Conservation Law Foundation. And Les, do you have a Twitter or a Facebook? Oh, yeah, I have a Facebook page. Uh, I actually went off Twitter when I saw who was following me. <laughs> but um, yeah, I'm, I'm easily reached through Facebook. Great. Um, so I will share the, those suggested social media posts with everyone now, and I hope you all will share some information and photos on, on your social media to let your friends and family know how incredible this underwater habitat is. Thanks so much, Michaela. Thank you, yeah, thank everyone. You for, thank you, everybody. Yeah, thank everyone for tuning in. At our ocean. Yeah, thank you for joining us tonight. Um, and again, I will also send the social media post out in an email, but it's in the chat for everyone's reference.